Uh, my name's Ross, and this is Left Bank Butchery here in Saks Hall, North Carolina. So this is a whole animal butchery. Uh, I guess that's what separates us from, from, from most butcher shops or meat markets that you would see. Um, we bring in animals, uh, pigs from Cane Creek Farm, which is right around the corner, about a couple minutes away. Uh, we bring in cows from Brayburn Farm, which is about 10, 15 minutes away. Uh, totally grass-fed beef, uh, pasture-raised pigs. Uh, we bring in the whole animal and then we get to making as many meals as possible out of it. We sell fresh meat, uh, we, we cut up all kinds of different steaks that people are not familiar with, uh, roasts, um, and then we also do a whole line of charcuteries and lunch meat products, different sausages, uh, terrines and pâtés. Um, we get soups and stocks, anything that we can make out of that whole animal. Cool, so we'll go in, take a look around, you'll teach us about different kinds of meats and cuts and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so why is whole animal butcher, why is that such a rare thing? Uh, well, it, first of all, it just takes a lot more work. Um, and it's really the way that our meat industry has, has moved away from. So if you want to order more ribeyes, you call up somebody and the next day you have more ribeyes. So it, it's a lot easier. Um, I don't know what we would do all day if, if that's how we did it, but um, the reason we don't do that, and there's a lot of reasons why we don't do that, I should say, but the, the primary one is in order to work with the farms that we want to work with, uh, you know, they raise animals. And so our commitment is to buy that entire animal and to figure out how best to, uh, to turn it into as many meals as possible after that. Uh, and, and, and I used to work for the farms and so we, we, I knew firsthand that it's not super helpful to have a chef call you up and say they want all your filet mignons uh, or a customer um, because that's 1% of the animal, 1% of the cow, and, and you got to figure out what to do with the other 99%. And so here at the shop, we, we pay the farmer for the animal, and then, and then we start to get creative after that. So, so in, in more mainstream meat processing, what happens to all those extra parts that aren't like less desirable that you guys are trying to turn into products to sell? Um, I mean, they really, they get, it's, it's really a global sort of uh, supply chain as you may have heard through things in the, in the news right now or in the last year. Um, a lot of it gets shipped overseas, you know, so maybe this, this, this cut is, you know, California loves tri-tips and in Korea they like some other cut that maybe doesn't sell well in America. Uh, so it's really a global thing and, and also our meat and our, our groceries in general are predicated on a lot of waste. Um, you know, the, the meat that goes, you know, there's all kinds of different numbers that are out there, but they're all pretty horrific as to uh, the amount of, of meat that gets thrown away out of grocery stores. Um, and, and, you know, we don't do that. We, we pay a lot of money for whole animals and, um, we wouldn't be in business if we were uh, if we didn't know how how to utilize the whole animal and, and preserve the whole animal through charcuterie, through um, through different things that we do. And so. another thing that's important to you is being connected directly to the farm and the animals that they're coming in from pretty close by, right? Yeah, I mean King Creek is around the corner, you know, four or five minutes away. Brayburn raises all of our cows, and they're about 10, 15 minutes away. Uh, I actually used to work, there used to be one farm and I worked there, so um, yeah, we know, we know exactly the story behind our animals. Um, and, and also, it's been interesting to see during the pandemic, um, in particular, how many shifts have happened in our, in our meat consumption as far as supply chain problems and everything else and we really haven't we haven't had any of those um, luckily our, our the slaughterhouses have been able to stay open around here and we're committed to the farm and the farm's committed to us and we haven't changed our prices through any of this um, so. cool I want to obviously show off the cool stuff that you're doing and the work that's really important you know being on the farming side of it it's always interesting to talk to the people that are then taking 
the products and getting them to the customers, and, and that's an important part of the whole process here. Um, so what are, I want to take a look at some stuff that you got going on here, because it's like most people don't get to see inside of a, a place <laughs> like this. So uh, can we take a look around a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. This is some of our uh, beef breaking going on right now. We call this a, a hind quarter. Technically, it's, a, it's, it's not quite a full quarter, but this is how the the cow comes in um, basically in six big pieces, and then we take it from there. Um, do our big breaking, and then we'll, uh, we'll sort of have it all set, and then we can break it for the case a little bit later. All right, so I just starting to cut this up. This is, what, what part of the cow is this to break this down simply? So a hind quarter would be your back, just literally your back leg. Okay. Um, if this were a pig, this would be what we would call the ham. You have a bunch of big lean muscles in the hind quarter. In the fore quarter, you have lots of smaller muscles. So some of our, some of our funkier steaks are in the fore quarter. This has um, sort of big, big roasts tend to be more in the hind quarter. A lot of things that are good for making roast beef. Um, the roulade in that we made this week, we uh, made that out of cutlets from these big, lean, powerful muscles. So. And this is called cutting from the rail. Uh, versus if I were cutting from the table, that's called cutting from the bench. And this one is nice because you can kind of use gravity. Um, and this is something we tend to do with, with larger cutting and then when we start getting things ready for the, for the case, we do that with uh, from the bench. So that's the top round. That's your tri-tip. So what I'm doing, what we do here at the shop is called seam butchery um, or continental butchery. Um, seam butchery means we are literally finding the seam between muscles. So, you know, if you Probably the easiest example I can think of is, you think of what a chuck roast is to most people. It's just like a big square. And, uh, you know, as you might imagine, um, muscles don't come as squares, right? So that's kind of our, our current way of doing um, butchery in America is to just sort of find these big sections. Um, so. For example, with the chuck roast, there's going to be some tough cuts in there, and there's going to be some tender cuts in that square, but you kind of have to cook it like it's all tough. And so what we do here is we, we pull out those individual, um, individual muscles, and we, we give the people who want something tender to grill or pan fry, uh, and if we give someone else something to braise, um, and so that's how, we, that's how we get all these weird steaks and weird roasts. So what I'm doing right now is following literally the seams in between different muscles. Here's the, the hind quarter. Very roughly broken, not ready for the case, obviously. Um, and we'll just continue to, to go at it. We got, um, here's our marrow bone that we'll, we'll slice in half so that people can easily roast it and put it on bread. We're gonna have our hind shanks up here. Um, asabuco, some people call it, uh, for beef anyway. And then uh, we got some knuckle bones here for people who wanna make their broth. Uh, here is a heel. Um, it's 
where the that's where the calf muscle well yeah, a little bit higher than that um, and there's one tender stake in here basically if a muscle is getting utilized um, as you would imagine everything on the leg would be getting a lot of work uh, it's going to have a lot of connective tissue so this cut right here it's called a pontineo it's got a lot of connective tissue and that one you definitely have to braise it's fantastic if you're willing to do it um, there's one tender cut in this heel region uh, called a Merlot steak. Or that's what some people call it anyway. That's what we call it. So, okay, so again, from that heel muscle, most of that would have just gone into a grinder for other people. Pontineo is a great brazing cut. This is just the side heel meat that we'll, uh, we can turn into stew beef or, or trim. And then this, once I clean it up, will be called a Merlot steak, and this will be ready for the grill. You, you grill that like you would like a flank steak. Um, so again, dividing it, and now we got, we got something for the brazing people, we got something for the grilling folks. Um, this is called, this is called a, a picanha. And uh, this will we'll clean up, and this people like to grill as an entire piece. Actually, this and the tri-tip, these are two great pieces when you want to throw something big on the grill. Uh, Picana has a really nice fat cap. In Brazil, they would cut this into two steaks, and, and then they put a skewer through it, and they, that's something you'd see at like a Brazilian steakhouse. Uh, so that's a fun one. Um, Again, fun things to cook if you have a, a handful of people over and you don't want to cook them individual steaks, which I never really like to do. Uh, this is called the top sirloin. There's a little seam that lives right in the middle of that. So we separate the top sirloin into two cuts. One is the, the top sirloin steaks, and the other one is a sirloin filet, which is even more tender. Point people in that direction a lot. So People who like filet mignon. So here, I'll clean that up, and those will be little medallions. That's the sirloin filet. Here we have our top sirloin. Has a nice fat cap on part of it. Let's make, I think they make great steaks. Then we have our big, lean, sort of the butt muscles, really, of the cow, um, which on a cow are called the rounds. So we have the top round, which is the big one, and it's got a little cap on the top of it. Uh, and that's what we're one of the cuts we're making roulade in with right now. Um, we got the bottom, that's a, the medium sized, and then the eye round. Um, and so we'll make roast beef out of all of these or other things. Uh, you'll see, like eye round is an offering for to put into pho, uh, you know, raw, and you drop it in there, and um, and then. Lastly, there's the, the sirloin tip, and there's a couple roasts here that I'll pull out from that. And this is called the H-bone. That's your, uh, basically your pelvic, or the cow's pelvic bone there. All right, so I see a ton of different parts here, and I hear about all these terms, but unless you're like familiar with them, it's a little overwhelming. So that's where someone like yourself and, the, and your staff and stuff can really help yeah. people understand all the stuff. You know, there's no, there's no real fundamental science that's different from, um, there's only three ways to cook meat, really. You braise it, which is slow cooking it in a liquid medium. Uh, you roast it, which is you, you create an ambient temperature and allow the, the air to, uh, to, to cook the meat. Or you do it through a direct heat, and that might be a skillet, that might be a grill, whatever. So, Yes, there's so many different cooking um, styles out there and different devices. Griddles and grills and 
different skillets and everything else, but really the, the, the science is exactly the same. There's heat coming from a direct source, and that's transferring the heat through, through the steak. And so, first of all, we try to simplify it by reminding people that there's only three ways to cook meat. If you're smoking it, if you're smoking meat, you're putting it in an oven and adding smoke to it. The smoke's for flavor, but you're not actually doing a fundamentally different process than putting it in an oven. Um, the flavor is going to be different, but again, the science is the same. And so we simplify it that way. And then, again, you know, the tri-tip and the pecanha, you know, those are, people would cook those probably in the same way. We got the merlot, the sirloin filet, and the top sirloin. Those would be all for kind of grilling. We got some braising cuts here. And then we have some, some larger roasts. So braise, roast, grill. Cool. Or, or pan fry or whatever you want. Okay, and so I know you're handling meat all the time, but what are some things that you look for with like good quality meat when you're looking, when you're looking at it? In terms of like, from a butcher standpoint, but also from a you know, person trying to buy the meat, like what are you looking for? Yeah. Um, Is it like color, I mean, texture, like what kind of things? So, uh, you know, because our stuff is grass fed, it's on a, it's on a really kind of a different scale than, than a grain finished animal. Our, our animals are gonna live, uh, you know, at least twice as long as your conventional um, feedlot animal. And with time, no matter what the animal, whether it's turkeys or pigs or cows, uh, the more time that it's on earth, it, uh, the more flavor it's going to have. Um, grass-fed beef is a real catch-all term because it's not super hard to do grass-fed beef. It is hard to do grass-fed beef well. Um, and you know, this is a, this is a really beautiful cow. Um, I am looking for, for that fat cover on it. Um, this, is, this is nice. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people doing grass-fed out there um, because there's starting to become a demand. Um, but but it, it does involve a lot of hard work for the farmer to do it really well, you know, because you do want to have that fat, you want to have that tenderness, and you don't do that just by not giving a cow anything but grass. You have to, you know, and this is what Braeburn does so well, that they're moving their cows throughout the day constantly putting them on good forage and uh, and then giving that land a lot of rest in order for them to come back on that so so yeah doing grass-fed beef well is, is a real challenge and if you find a farmer who's doing that then, you know okay and so what in your background in working on farms has that really been inspirational and, and this part of what you're doing now and how you understand all this stuff yeah yeah I mean I loved farming I still on a beautiful day like today miss not, not being out on the farm um, yesterday when it was raining all day, I didn't mind being inside, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I still go out to the farms and give people tours of them. I still, you know, to me, what we're doing and what they're doing is, it's, you know, it, it, we, we need both. Well, we certainly need them, but I think that they certainly benefit from somebody, you know, if this cow is going to take two and a half years to, to raise to weight, you know, you want to make sure that that you get these these cuts. I mean, these cuts are, are tough to get from a local processor, a local slaughterhouse, um, you know, but like I said, when you spend two and a half years raising the animal, you, you want it to be cut well. Okay, and what about, this has gotta be fresher than what I could buy like in a store. I mean, essentially, you hung them for a couple weeks, but like these are gonna go out for sale pretty soon, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're preparing the stuff for the case. Like I said, the, the hanging is, is for, the customers. It, it, it does not help our bottom line. Uh, it does quite the opposite. But, um, you know, beef ages so, so well. You can see just how beautiful this beef is um, because of how it's being hung and what conditions. And then once we cut it down to this, you know, it's going to go into that case and it's going to be be super fresh. So we make a, a bunch of different sausages here. Uh, we'll make like a fresh sausage, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but this one, this is a, an emulsified sausage. These are currywurst for our Oktoberfest. Uh, and this one is a beef and pork uh, sausage uh, that has been smoked but by Rodrigo. He's the one who made them, so I'll tell you how it's done. Yeah. Um... 
So these just came out of the smoker. They are, as Ross said, beef and pork. Uh, they're very similar to a hot dog. Um, an emulsified sausage is a sausage in which the the proteins, the meat, um, and the and the fat is turned into a paste and bound together. Um, so it uh, it becomes like a, a homogenous um, product. It involves. Um, I mean, it's it's a pretty pretty scientific process, really. Through you you gotta you gotta get your temperatures right. Um, you gotta um, you gotta mix your your fats and your your proteins at, at different times. Um, as you can see, it's completely homogenous. Um, it's all together. A, a fresh sausage is gonna have different particles that, that are not bound together. It'll, it'll crumble if you cut it open. Um, this won't. Uh, so things like mortadella, bologna, hot dogs, those are all emulsifieds. Um, and... Uh, so you guys do both, both styles here? Both styles, yeah. Okay. yeah. We, do, we also do smoked sausages. Um, which are not emulsified, like kielbasa and andouille. Um, those actually, it's it's larger larger chunks of meat that go into the casing, and um, and in in the cooking process they bind together. So, uh, but once you cut into it, you can see the isolated you know pieces of fat and meat. So this is andouille. You can see there that there's meat and little pockets of fat. Um, so is this just a style thing based on different types? Style, texture, exactly. Um, this wouldn't really work as an emulsified product. That's just not how it's made. Um, whereas currywurst and hot dogs, you can see there it's like one solid mass. Um, Lots of German sausages are emulsified. Weisswurst, lots of, there's a bratwurst. We make a fresh bratwurst, um, but but a lot of bratwursts are also are emulsified and smoked. Um, All right, so we're gonna go make some sausage today too? Yeah, we'll make some sausage. Uh, we're gonna make uh, our version of a Slim Jim, if you will. It's, we call it beef stick or snack stick. Uh, Jason's making them right now. Cool. Um, we'll go and, check it out. Yeah. Uh, most sausages we do in natu natural casings, either lamb or pork casings. Uh, but for our salamis, Ron Schweigers, things like that pepperoni, mortadella. We use a synthetic casing. Um, traditionally you'd use a beef middle, which is a beef intestine that's quite large, but they're a little difficult to source. And these are cellulose and they actually hold up really, really well and they're super strong. So, um, to do salami, I'm just gonna fill this thing up. We always get them, we always get them wet so that they're more pliable. You don't wanna stuff a dry casing. We want to pack it in there tight. Anything that's not in there nice and tight is going to give you air pockets, which is going to give you kind of a unsettling texture when you slice it. So I keep a nice tight grip on it. And I want to really pack it in. So most of our sausages and things that we do are pork based, but uh, our salami coat is 100% beef. Grinder, set that one aside. It's tight as a tip. Casing. All right, so, and then the mixture is depending on what kind of uh, product you're making, and is that like recipe specific for what you guys yeah. have? Yeah, we have, you know, 
50 or 100 recipes that we developed here in the shop for different sausages that we do. Um, and this one's pretty, pretty straightforward with beef and we use two different grinds in order to give it a nice texture. The fat only gets pushed through the grinder once, which gives it nice flecks of white fat. And it's pretty straightforward, with, you know, salt and pepper, coriander, there's a little bit of Worcestershire in here. It's a very, very straightforward salami. Now, All right, so what's going on in that machine there? Is that just like a, basically a press? It's exactly what it is. Okay, and then you have different size like tips at the bottom here? Yeah, we have different size necks for it. Um, and this thing, we typically do 30 pound batches of sausage because this, the capacity on this is 30 pounds. Um, this is a Frederick Dick, it's a German company and it's kind of like the, the standard for sausage presses. It's a super nice machine. And so, now we get to do the salami rodeo. So we've got our salami all packed up here and it's important to keep tight pressure uh, once it's in the casing. So we do what we uh, affectionately call the salami rodeo. I take my twine, I get a good grip, and I'm gonna spin this salami while wrapping the twine around it. And as you do it, tightens the casing down around the salami. All right, and now I'll tie it off. You can see how effective it is at giving you this like really nice coil here. It basically cinches down the top of the salami. And then what happens with the salami after this point? So I'll prick it with the sausage prick, um, what that does, it allows any excess moisture to evaporate out because it will hang overnight. Um, so it'll hang overnight. And then tomorrow it'll go in the smoker um, for a sausage this size, depending upon how full the smoker is, it'll take six or seven hours probably. Um, goes back into the smoker for a night, or I'm sorry, goes back into the walk-in for a night, cools down, and so this will be in the case on Saturday. And I'm trying to hit any air pockets I see so that the case can harden around it. And there's one salami cooker. All right, so people are coming into a shop like this, the products are gonna look very different probably than going to a supermarket or something like that. Can you talk about some of the different products that you offer here? Yeah, because, because we're bringing in the whole animal, um, you know, if you go to a grocery store, you might have a choice between maybe three steaks, um, some ground beef, maybe a couple roasts. Uh, instead, I would, I'd say we probably have 20 different steaks here. Um, and a lot of them people are not familiar with. So a lot of what we do is um, help people be successful in their kitchen. Um, that, that's what we're here for. That's when you, when you show up, you're always going to talk to a butcher. You're going to talk to people who have worked in the restaurant industry uh, or who are avid home cooks. And uh, yeah, so we'll have, like I said, maybe 20 different steaks that, that are available. We'll have tons of different roasts. Um, yeah, got all of our beef here. Uh, we didn't bring in a lamb this week, but we also we also do lamb. Um, got our pork over here, a couple fresh sausages that we made. We're sort of doing an Oktoberfest themed week uh, this week, just to maybe keep ourselves entertained, keep our keep our customers entertained. So we we have a um, a beer sausage that we made with the brewery, which is. Um, Hot River Ales, their Bavarian lager. Uh, we made a beer sausage with that. We made a bacon bratwurst. Um, and then we made a currywurst, uh, sort of like a curry flavored hot dog, so to speak. Uh, and then we're, the guys are making roulade in right now, which is um, a beef um, cutlet that's got mustard and bacon and pickles in it. So anyway, just something to sort of change it up because the animals always kind of come in the same. All so. right, so you got some stuff that's like really fresh, some stuff that's aged, is that right? Yeah, so we, well, we hang our cows for about two weeks. Um, that's something that we do for the quality of the meat. Uh, that happens at a slaughterhouse, then we bring it in, start cutting it. And so that's can you explain why that's important? Yeah, um, 
I mean, the, the big guys don't do this because you lose water weight, and, and ultimately that's what you're selling is, is stuff by the pound. Um, but we do it because uh, it starts to, it tenderizes the meat, and you lose a lot of water, which uh, is actually beneficial to the flavor. Um, there's sort of enzymes breaking it down, making it more tender, more flavorful. Um, so yeah, we, we, we go about two weeks, and um, then we bring it in. Uh, I came in yesterday afternoon, we start cutting it. That's what's in the case right now. Um, our pigs, um, they'll hang about four days, so a little less on them. Um, we bring them in and start cutting them. And so everything on the bottom shelf is gonna be all of our fresh meat. Uh, and then on the, on the top shelf, that would be our, our charcuterie offerings. So lots of different lunch meats. Um, we don't do any dry cured stuff, but we do, we do lots of things, lots of terrines and pâtés and things for a good charcuterie board, but also uh, some, some staple uh, kind of lunch meats. You know, what we're, what we're really trying to do here is like help this community uh, have access to, to really good food. And, and I think you do that through accessible things like lunch meats and soups. And is it the fanciest stuff in the world? No, and, and we do, we do some fancy terrines and pâtés, but I think if you're really gonna sort of uh, make an effort to, to change the, uh, the, the way people eat, uh, you, you got to do kind of those those everyday items. Absolutely. So, so what do you got going over here in this case over here? Yeah, here's some of our frozen stuff. So because, for example, since they're coming in whole animal, we're uh, they're obviously coming with lots of bones, and you know a big thing of whole animal butcher shops is, is really uh, you know it's not just breaking the animal. But what do you do with all those parts that take extra effort? So. Um, you know, we got our pho broth here. Uh, we make a ramen broth. We make uh, a bunch of different soups in addition to that, pozole. And uh, then we just have our regular meat, sto meat stocks. Um, you know, different meatballs here. We got a Moroccan meatball, Italian meatball. We got pho meatballs. Um, so you can get your pho, you can get your meatballs. We can thinly slice some beef for you and you can have pho at home. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, different offerings like that. Ross, a big part of what you guys offer is not only awesome products, but when people come in, you have to sort of coach them a little bit and teach them, right? Right. Is that a big part of what you have to do here? Yeah, you know, um, like I said, there's, a, there's only so much of the, of the prime cuts on an animal. And, um, and also sometimes they, like, these animals cost a lot of money. And you know, eating ribeye every single night is, is, is not in most people's budget. Um, and so, you know, luckily the whole world has been eating uh, whole animals with a whole animal approach for a long time. And that's why all the great dishes uh, throughout the world really uh, have been generated with that in mind of, of utilizing the whole animal, utilizing uh, the bones and the lesser known cuts. Um, so a lot of what we do here is educate people about all those other cuts. Uh, I mean, we have to from a, from a business standpoint, but we. We also want people to, to love cooking and to feel comfortable in their own kitchen, um, which uh, is a, a pet peeve of mine that I, I feel like people people feel intimidated, maybe too many cooking shows or uh, you know, feeling like they need to be a chef. Um, so, you know, we, first of all, we bring in tons of different steaks here um, and, and we'll educate people about those different ones, um, but also, you know, bringing in like uh, rices and, and beans and, and grits that are raised right down the road um, and, and sort of reintroducing people to some dishes that utilize meat um, but maybe not as the, the singular focus on the plate. So instead of the ribeye on the plate, uh, you know, have you actually made red beans and rice? And, and you know, so we make tasso ham all the time in the case um, and, and the tiniest bit of that can flavor a whole dish. Um, and it's, it's super inexpensive. Uh, we have lots of recipes and, and talk to people a lot about braising and, and other ways to utilize um, some, of those, some of those lesser known cuts, but ones that if you know what you're doing, they can be every bit as delicious as, as the prime cuts, sometimes more so. so.
And we, we all like talk about sustainable food, but part of it is like sustainability in that like we're using the whole animal. We're like taking the most out of it. We're stretching as far as possible. Exactly. We're, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of my goal right there. It's like not how many animals can we, can we go through or anything like that, um, but, but, but how can we actually stretch these animals as much as possible? Uh, how many meals can we actually put into this community here um, with as few animals as possible? And that's, that's, that's why this job doesn't really get old, is because we, we kind of figure a, a new way to stretch it um, uh, every week, and, it, and it's fun. Quite frankly, a lot of people need that fun right now. <laughs> Everybody's at home and cooking. <laughs> Absolutely. Ross, you got a super cool thing going on here. Uh, but one thing I think is really unique, not just in terms of your business, but the location. So can you talk about being in Saks Baja and those kinds of things? Yeah, it's, a, it's an unusual place to put a, a whole animal butcher shop, but this is where the animals are raised. It's also where I live. Um, and it's also just this amazing community. You know, if you're into the outdoors, uh, we got lots of trails, uh, paddling. Uh, two awesome restaurants. We got a great brewery, um, a beautiful ballroom for concerts. Uh, it's kind of all the things that I want. So some great businesses, some great people here as well. I've interacted with people here over the last few years, and uh, it's just incredible. So where can people find your products? Obviously here at the shop, but anywhere else locally? Um, yeah, and also our um, our other shop is Alimentari at Left Bank. Um, that is in the Transfer Company Food Hall in Raleigh. Beautiful um, uh, food hall that they've put together on the southeast corner of downtown. We teamed up with um, the team over at Mother and Son's Restaurant. And uh, so we're doing, we're, we're taking all this meat and we have all that fresh meat, but then we keep going with it even further. So we're doing lots of sandwiches, but also hand rolled pastas and sort of imagine a, an old world Italian sort of market in Delhi. Well, I really appreciate and admire all the work that you do. I'll leave links down below for all your information. And thanks again for taking time to show us around today. All right. Thank you.